There we go. Hello, welcome everyone. I'll give folks a minute to settle in. Um, but I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, but we may have people joining us from other parts of Australia and I encourage you to acknowledge the lands you are living on using the chat function. It's always a, it is a tremendous privilege to be here on country. The lands have never been ceded, always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. Today, we're talking on the topic of online abuse and harassment. This material can be hard going. I encourage all participants to prioritize your well-being and safety. We will be putting contact details for support, support services in the chat, and please do some, take some time out if you need to and make use of those services if required. Today, we're launching Cyber Smart Women, a resource developed by Gender Equity Victoria to assist women and the gender diverse with steps that they can take if they're facing online abuse and harassment. This is the resource's official launch, and I wanna wish it well. I encourage you all to go make yourselves familiar with it after this talk. I'd like to kick off the discussion by introducing our esteemed panel and asking them to briefly detail why the topic of addressing online harassment is particularly important to them. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Maria Jacuti and I'm the General Manager at the Victorian Women's Trust and your moderator today. In 2020, VWT through the Cono and Sub Fund allocated grant money to support the development of Cyber Smart Women. It's a great example of the really wonderful initiatives we help seed and support by funding with the gender lens. Women from all over, both in their personal and professional lives are increasingly reporting online spaces as toxic sites for misogyny and abuse. Even more heartbreakingly, women are reporting that they are having unsatisfactory experiences in shutting down cyber hate or seeking recourse. We were keen to support a resource that would not only give people tools to better understand their rights, but also a mechanism to have ongoing conversations with regulators and police on ways we can continuously improve the outcomes and decrease the incidence of cyber hate. Our first panelist today is Lauren Calloway, Assistant Commissioner, Victorian Police. Lauren, what's your involvement with Cyber Smart Women and why is the topic, this topic important to you? Um, well, I'm in charge of the Family Violence, Sexual Assault and Child Abuse Command that we have. It's called the Family Violence Command, but it covers off a much broader remit around women's safety. Um, I think it's probably just inherent to our role as, as police officers. We, we put a lot of effort into making people feel safe in their homes, safe on the roads, safe in community. And this particular crime has kind of crossed into a new area um, for us around people being attacked, but from the um, from a technology facilitated abuse um, perspective. And we are really keen to, to be very responsive to that type of crime. It, it generally comes with awful threats and terrible things said that you wouldn't say to a person if you were if you were there with them. So police are really keen to be very responsive to this. Thank you. Um, next panellist to introduce is Marion Basada, who's a lawyer, writer and advocate whose work I hugely admire. Why is today's topic of interest to you, Marion? Um, thank you. And it's great to be here. I'm joining you from Kamaragal land as well. Um, why, uh, yeah, why is it, I'd say it's one of those things where I'd love to not be interested in this topic, but it's, uh, you know, I was forced into it um, given that I've faced myself quite a lot of cyber abuse over the years that I've done um, a bunch of advocacy work. Um, so uh, I've become really familiar with, uh, you know, this area, but not on a voluntary basis uh, when you're kind of forced into it because you come, you become a victim of it. Um, and I'm really pleased to hear that this is a topic and, and an area um, that is getting much more attention, um, both from a legal policy framework and general um, awareness as well. Um, and I know that from my experience, which I'm happy to go into, you know, a little bit later on, um, what tends to happen is um, women of diverse backgrounds, um, there's this intersectional layer um, when it comes to cyber abuse that, uh, and I know with some of the abuse that I faced, it, it certainly was very much intersectional in nature as well. So I'm, I am really pleased that this has been um, taken a lot more seriously than it was in 2015 when I started first encountering cyber abuse. Thank you so much for that. Um... And also on our panel is Tess Chapel. 
Tess is a lawyer at Morris Blackburn. Tess, what's your involvement with Cyber Smart Women and why is this topic important to you? Uh, well, this topic is important to me because I am a young woman who uses the internet um, and I'm concerned about the way that um, these devices and um, the internet is being used to harass and subjugate um, women like me um, in, their, in their own personal experiences. But also in my work, um, I advocate for women experiencing discrimination and sexual harassment, and that does ex extend to online spaces as well. So this is something that I'm familiar with in my, my employment. Thanks so much, Tess. Our next speaker is the woman who headed the team developing Cyber Smart Women, Caitlin McGrain. Caitlin is project lead at Gender Equity Victoria. Caitlin, has your interest and understanding of online harassment changed as you develop this resource? Thanks, Maria. And um, thank you to everybody for being here. I'm joining you from Wurundjeri country. Um, my interest and in my sort of um, understanding of this topic has really changed quite a lot since um, I started developing the resource because I sort of started it thinking that, you know, that there was, there was really, there was a real lack of understanding, I think, in the community about what, what avenues are currently available. And just sort of anecdotally, like I've shared um, with Lauren before, and with both um, Tess and Sophie, that when women approached, when we heard anecdotally that when women were approaching the police or other sort of um, legal, investigating other, other legal options, they were finding it really difficult to navigate and finding it very sort of overwhelming. Um, and also finding that perhaps they weren't getting the response, which in my, my experience was that when I went to the police to report harassment, I did not get a great response. And I think that there is a real appetite for change um, across this sector, like we've seen it from, um, from Lauren and her team, like this real interest and dedication and, and commitment to changing that experience. Um, and as Mariam said, like acknowledging the intersectional nature of this kind of abuse is something that I think we need to get a lot better at um, understanding, but also sort of addressing from, from that perspective as well. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Lastly, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sophie Parsons. Sophie's a senior associate at Doug and George Lawyers. Sophie, how did you come to be involved in Cyber Smart Women and why is the topic of online harassment and abuse important to you? Well, it was a fantastic resource to have the opportunity to contribute to. It is something through um, my work that I'm seeing increasingly frequently, um, on not necessarily as an, the kind of offending on its own. It's often mixed up with a whole range of different sorts of offending, whether that's um, as part of um, intimate relationships or, or otherwise. Um, and what is so important for anybody experiencing this kind of um, harassment is to understand what the options are that are available to them and what the prospects are of um, having the matter resolved or addressed um, very, via various means. And often what is so important is information and information and options so that individuals experiencing this kind of harassment um, know um, what is available to them. And so if um, this resource has provided individuals with some more information um, and agency in, in responding to these kinds of issues, then that's a fantastic thing to have been a part of and I'm sure it will. Thanks so much, Sophie. Uh, let's kick off the panel chat with the fundamentals. What exactly is online harassment? How do I know if what I'm experiencing online is grounds for complaint or action? Caitlin, maybe you can start us off here and then we might chat to Lauren. Oh, that's, uh, that's a tricky question to answer as a non-expert without um, a legal <laughs> background. Um, but basically what we think of as being harassment is something that is online harassment is um, something that is sort of designed to intimidate, harass, bully um, through sort of online mechanisms. So that's sort of through um, social media, texts, WhatsApp, all sorts of different sort of online online means. Um, we've also seen it in things like um, 
and I'm sure that Lauren and uh, sorry, uh, Tess and Sophie can talk about this in a bit more detail, like harassing and um, intimidating blog posts um, and that sort of thing, um, like online online news and that sort of stuff that's sort of designed to belittle, intimidate or harass. Yeah, I can see Tess shaking her head feverishly there. Do you want to have a crack at how I know if I'm being, if what, what I'm experiencing is something that I might want to take further? Uh, well, yes, Caitlin is correct that um, you would you would look at um, the conduct by by the person online and assess whether well am I intimidated by this conduct? Is it offending me? Um, does it humiliate me in any way? What kind of effect is this having on me and my feelings of personal safety um, and the way that I go about my life? Um, we would probably cons we would look at that to work out whether it is. Um, so serious as to be considered harassment, um, but whether it's then um, taken a step further and if anything is is done to address the behaviour um, is a bit more of a longer conversation um, considering what the, um, the person receiving the behaviour wants to achieve and, and what resources they have and how much energy they want to dedicate to it. Yeah. Um, Lauren, what kind of what what what's online harassment from the police perspective? What kind of um, complaints are you seeing or seeing go further? Well, I think um, we just mentioned that it sort of doesn't fit into nice little neat boxes that someone does one thing and it's this. It can come across as a whole range of things. Probably the first thing police will always try to identify is what's the nature of the relationship between the person experiencing the online harassment and the person doing it because if it's a former partner or there, or there is a family viol a family relationship then there's a, a I suppose a whole pathway of family violence related responses that can be both criminal and civil um, criminal as far as charging and civil as far as safety orders that sort of thing but if there isn't a relationship then we tend to see things that are around either they're wrapped up in broader stalking behaviors um, threats. There's, so there's, a, so there's a, some crime streams there. So stalking is obviously a criminal offence. Making threats is also a criminal offence. Um, but then you might have um, stuff that doesn't quite meet that threshold, but it, it causes someone to feel very unsafe and in fear. And so there's the personal safety order civil stream that can be done. And I probably should add that one of the other things that we've kind of worked up in our, um, our toolkit for, for today and going forward is there's always the issue around defamation as well, depending on, on what the person has written yeah. and how broad, broadly that's been um, pub, you know, publicised. Thank you. Uh, Sophie, I might ask you to start off on this question. Um, what's the extent of the problem? What are you seeing, you know, kind of come across your desk in terms of people raising this as an issue? What kinds of impacts does this have in human terms? It's as Lauren um, identified already, um, the kinds of um, matters can be with respect to simply civil matters, that is personal safety um, orders or um, intervention orders if it's in the family context. Um, but what often can be the case is that it forms part of a um, brief uh, which contains a number of different charges. That is, the conduct has given rise to a number of different um, charges and, and possible criminal conduct. That is, the police have charged an individual um, for conduct and that conduct might be something like stalking, which is an offence within the Crimes Act, or use carriage service to harass which is something in the Commonwealth Criminal Code, an offence in the Commonwealth Criminal Code, or perhaps even breaches of orders, such as personal safety orders that have been in place already. Um, so a breach of a personal safety order is an offence contained within, within the Personal Safety Order Act. Um, so what is often the case is that there is conduct which might be um, in the form of um, some kind of online abuse or sharing of intimate images, um, using different... Um, sorts of um, means to communicate inappropriately or to share information um, with, with others or publicly. Um, and it can be, um, as I've said, on its own, but represented by a number of different offences across the board. Also, as Lauren said, um, it is 
uh, often accompanied by, say, threat charges, whether that's um, threat to kill or threat to um, commit a sexual offence, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it then um, is, it can form part of a, a, a greater brief in that way. Um, that is, the conduct can simply be the sharing of these messages or it can be that perhaps this has occurred in the course of a relationship or an ongoing course of events where it's in combination with other sorts of criminal conduct also. Um, so unfortunately, it is something that is... Um, forms part of generally greater issues or greater relationship issues, um, often that's the case. Uh, Mariam, I might um, just ask you, what, what's your perception of the extent of the problem and what, you know, we're, we're hearing about kind of the legal side of things and what our options are there, it's very interesting, but what is this actually like in human terms? Hmm. Um, so I'd say... Uh, we know that cyber abuse, um, whilst there's a perhaps a heightened level of awareness about it now, we know that it's actually increased. Um, during COVID, you know, young women um, particularly uh, are facing a lot more cyber abuse. Um, so in terms of what it looks like and feels like in, in, in the real world, I suppose the most um, horrendous experiences I've had date back from a couple of years now, but it is something that continues. Um, obviously, some of the examples we're talking about can be in the context of a personal domestic relationship, um, but then also it's from complete strangers online, um, as is the case with mine. Um, although in some instances, the cyberbullying was such that the individuals that did target me happened to use their real names. And, and that happens to be the, incident, the, the scenarios where I was able to take some action. But what normally happens is you do get targeted by individuals that are really sophisticated in their use of the internet um, they um, will you know nothing will be showing you're not able to trace any details you can take all the screenshots you like but unfortunately it's hard to trace some of these individuals over the time that I've um, faced cyber abuse that sort of started around 2015 and truth be told continues to this day um, in the sense and it, it just it's changed it's evolved so to give you an example on a regular basis now um, it, despite the fact that I've got multiple uh, processes set up on my Facebook account my Twitter account Instagram um, emails all these additional security features in place and despite that I get regular emails saying you know, you know, when you go to change your um, email, you get a notification of here's the number that you're trying to, I get notifications all the time that someone's trying to change my details. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that continues because I do, I still continue to do some advocacy work with the Islamophobia Register. And so on a regular basis, um, I'd have my Facebook accounts trying, you know, trying to get it hacked. It still goes on to this day. So I could be, you know, um, just going about my day and I happen to check my email account and there'll be notifications in there. And I used to get it on my phone as well. Um, and it was just an ongoing thing. Um, so, yeah, that, that's an example of the ongoing impact. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it really brings up an important point about what are the limitations of the law in dealing with online harassment? How do police and the law respond to ever-changing online platforms and the way that people can be harassed online? Maybe we'll start with you, Lauren. Yeah, look, I think some, firstly, and um, Maria has highlighted, one of the limitations is the anonymity of the user. So in order for us to initiate any kind of criminal investigation, we have to try and identify who the person is that's doing it. Um, and that can be difficult, if they're particularly if they're technically savvy. I think years ago, you know, there was probably a smaller group of people who were technically savvy at, at this type of stuff. And now it seems to be really quite broad. Um, so I don't think it takes much to go out and be abusive in an online environment. But the trick for police is establishing an evidence base on, on how to prove that it was that person who did it with that device. Um, the other thing that's probably a bit of a barrier is not all offences are criminal. Um, they might be in a broader pattern of abuse, um, and that's where it's really important for us to kind of get the whole story out from someone. 
Um, but I think in many cases, women might have initially come forward with something that's quite minor, but just doesn't feel right. And that's potentially where they haven't always got the best service from police. Whereas when there are really clear criminal behaviours that go with it, then we, we are, tend to come across as more responsive. That's where the safety orders and the um, personal safety um, orders, the, so family violence safety orders, intervention orders and personal safety orders can be really handy because they really clearly detail what is a breach in contacting the person. And when we have a breach, we are very, that's pretty straightforward. We can do something with that. So I know that in the past, one of the first pieces of advice police have said has, have you got an order in place? Go and get an order. And then we'll, and then, you know, that gives us more power to, to prosecute the person. Um, on the stalking legislation, it can be a bit difficult for members to apply. I, that's not to say it doesn't happen. I was looking at the data um, in preparation for today. You know, with traditional stalking under the Crimes Act, we have we would probably charge at least a couple of thousand people a year with that offence. And then the, the offence that was mentioned, the Commonwealth offence around using a telecommunications device to harass, we do that a lot. We have, we've charged over 7,000 people with that offence in a 12-month period. So we are responsive to those offences, but the stalking one comes down. It's a little bit harder because it's around police sort of needing to be aware of the motivating fa factors and the, and the risks posed by the offender to make sure that we are dealing with the safety piece as well as the offending piece. Um, I think... I think it, it comes down to the way the story can be told as well, a, a victim's perception of what, what is happening and how that gets uh, recorded and understood by the police officer. And that's why it's, this launch has been such a great thing because in this example, we've partnered with Genvic and we've developed materials for the victim to work on, but it's a kind of an inward facing and an outward facing launch because we've also worked on materials that will help our frontline police officers understand what they're hearing when they when the story is told by a victim. I think it's so important that it be a two-way street. And it's one of the things that really appealed to us about the project and the wonderful uh, part of the initiative. Sophie, I wonder if you might um, tackle the question of what you see as being the limitations of the law with dealing in the on, online harassment, um, particularly perhaps how that might be with ever-changing platforms people yes. in different locations. Yes, um, certainly that's the case. And I've um, seen matters which have involved um, contact uh, whilst people are overseas or interstate or, um, and it can become quite complicated in, in that way. Um, as to the limitations, in short, it's about securing the kind of favourable outcome uh, that people might hope to achieve by approaching police or approaching the courts. Ideally, people are doing that to stop behaviours that have been concerning or deeply distressing to them. That's why they've approached police um, to make a complaint or approached the court directly to um, make an appropriate application for an order um, seeking that kind of protection. The way that police need to assess a matter, and of course Lauren spoke to this, but also um, spoke to, about that already in the courts, is that they need to be satisfied that conduct um, does amount to um, the threshold required for an order. That is dictated by the legislation that, uh, that applies to those orders. Um, when a court, when a magistrate or um, some other kind of judicial officer is assessing whether or not to make an order, or to um, find a person guilty of an offence, they're also bound to the definitions of offences and the elements of the offences that are contained in their respective um, pieces of legislation. So it can be the case that um, somebody has experienced really concerning um, harassment online. They may not be able to identify that person um, or that person may have used um, such sophisticated means that it's not possible to identify them. Sometimes um, individuals can be very suspicious and with good reason that they know who is responsible for contact, contacting them by various means, um, but um, that person has um, used uh, been able to conceal their identity or use somebody else's identity or perhaps even made up um, details to hide, uh, to conceal their own. So um, 
it can also be that the so first issue can be that it can be difficult to identify the person that would need to be charged or that would need to be the subject of an order um, protecting the person that has been harassed. Um, that's why this resource is so important in the way that it sets out the steps that a person must take so that when they do approach the police with their concerns, they're able to substantiate that um, with the material that would greatly assist the police and then a court to be able to make the appropriate order or to have that person ultimately convicted um, and found guilty in relation to criminal offences. So that can be an area where it can be um, difficult, um, certainly, to identify the person and second, secondly, whether or not the conduct in fact amounts to the offences that um, have been charged by police. Um, so they can be um, the issues, that, that is that conduct can be deeply concerning and distressing to a person, but whether or not it then amounts to, to a criminal offence is a separate consideration. Um, finally, I would say um, that a limitation with respect to these matters can be um, a fairly simple one, and that is delay with respect to court matters. Courts are overwhelmed by, um, by matters, um, and particularly as a result of COVID. Um, that means that there can be significant delays in having matters um, resolved in a favourable way for the person who's raised the complaint or sought the protection of an order. Um, it also doesn't guarantee that the person might get the outcome they hoped for that another person would be convicted of a criminal offence. Um, so it can, there, there are a number of different factors which can pose limitations, but certainly if a person is experiencing this kind of harassment, it shouldn't deter them from seeking the assistance of police or, or other um, relevant um, authorities. Yeah, so while we're on other relevant authorities and our options here, what are the options? Um, Caitlin, you've been developing the resource. I'm sure you have a pretty firm understanding of what the options are out there because I'm sure that there is police and the law, but there are other options also. Thanks, Maria, and thanks everybody for those contributions. I think that it's sort of raised some really um, valuable detail, I think, about what those limitations of the law might be, which then, for me, I think leads into thinking about how we can make communities safer through sort of preventative measures. So sort of going back to that, like our watch change the story framework where we're addressing the gender drivers of this kind of harassment. Because as Lauren and Sophie were both saying, you know, when women go to the police and they say, I'm being harassed, if it doesn't meet a particular threshold, then they can feel really disempowered and really, really isolated and alone. And I think that in um, if what we're seeing is the kind of uh, that sort of ca like a casualization ev and everydayness to harassment, to sexism, misogyny, and you know racism um, online, those things I think should also be tackled from a community perspective. So they need to be addressed in, um, as people are saying in the chat, in schools in universities, um, in at sort of our everyday uh, per interpersonal interactions, those sorts of things I think are really, really valuable mm -hmm. um, because I, I'm really sort of, I'm really proud of this resource that we've developed together. I think it's a really um, important um, document uh, that will really help people. Um, but I also think that it's important for us to recognize that what we, what I, and I think a lot of us really want, isn't necessarily more people prosecuted and more people um, uh, locked up or, you know, fined or, you know, in facing any kind of, um, not necessarily sort of facing those punitive um, outcomes, but really we want the behaviour to stop and we want the attitudes to change. And I think that that's a much bigger and longer piece of work than this, um, this document. Um, but I think that like acknowledging what is possible given the current frameworks that we have means that we can find ways of working with, but also around and sort of um, in, 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 in sort of complementary ways, I suppose. Uh, Mariam, I wonder if you might be able to speak to that topic there about um, options that are available for dealing with online harassment. Um, I'm particularly interested in your work with the Islamophobia Register and, um, you know, what kinds of uh, means have you tried in dealing with online harassment? Some been more successful than others? Mm. 
Um, yeah, great question. I guess um, those options have evolved from when I first started um, experiencing cyber abuse. So if I reflect back around 2015, um, the options were very limited. The level of awareness in law enforcement um, was, I felt like at the time, almost non-existent. Um, and so there was the options were incredibly limited at that point, which which made it a lot harder. Um, what I was able to do, to the extent that some of the abuse um, was, you know, the individual behind it was identified, um, I was able to rely on using, um, the reference was made earlier to um, the federal friends of using a carriage uh, to cause offence, um, menace and harass. And I, at that point, I remember I'd all of it memorised because it was just like, oh, yeah, this just comes up so often. Um, so that's what I was able to do in the situations where I was able to take action through the police. But um, on those limited occasions where that was, I was able to do that successfully, it took an exceptionally long period of time. Um, we're talking over a year in the one case. And so we're to, uh, going back and forth with the, with the police, uh, going back and forth with uh, just trying to gather enough evidence. Um, uh, I remember many occasions where the police would visit my house and they'd say to me, well, is it possible for you to just get off the internet? Um, and I remember there was a period of time where my anxiety was actually um, increasing because I f it was it, it was almost verging on victim blaming um, in terms of some of the engagement that I had, and that was not helpful, and it just dragged on and on and on. In saying that, this is why I'm so pleased that we now have additional resources. Fast forward several years, and now um, one of the reasons I set up the Islamophobia Register in 2014, which, which ultimately then helped you know bring on some of this cyber abuse as I became a victim of it um, was because of the you know the fact that there weren't many options uh, for people particularly in, in my situation um, women of color culturally diverse women in particular people of a Muslim faith but you know we know there's all sorts of cyber abuse um, that minority groups face and so the the register uh, was a means of, you know, um, an external organisation that was independent of law enforcement that people could turn to, um, you know, as a means of, and and um, but it, and then we would often try our best to then connect them with law enforcement. Um, I mean, now obviously the options are perfect. It's not to say that there isn't room. I think we might have left. Oh. Hello, Mariam. I'm so sorry about you bringing that. Particularly in terms of understanding. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> we lost your life. Perhaps we'll just, let's go to the next. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> my internet's a bit up and down. Um, Tess, I might go to you. Um, do you think there's work to be done on community education and awareness around this issue? I oh, mean, I would. Yeah, you could see with the Islamophobia register, the power of community activity um, in creating change and reform. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's always room for better community engagement. I think um, awareness has risen over the last couple of years in terms of what um, cyber harassment is, what it looks like and how damaging it can be to the individual receiving it. Um, we have heard repeatedly in the media these kinds of stories about um, women being harassed in their everyday life and through their work as well, if they're quite present online and when they've um, complained about it, being told, well, just get off the internet. Um, but that isn't um, an option available for most people because the internet is so wrapped up in our, in our lives and our work that by getting off the internet, you're actually... Um, preventing so many opportunities for work and, and to succeed in your work. Um, but I think that kind of conversation, it's we've moved away from that kind of thinking now. And in fact, um, we do see that um, even in my work, um, we see uh, people who have been accused of um, harassing other colleagues online, um, bullying people through online devices, 
um, are being raised as serious concerns in their workplaces and they are facing um, allegations of misconduct and serious misconduct and workplaces are taking it very seriously because they see it as a very poor reflection on the reputation of their workplace if they have employees who are harassing um, other colleagues, but also other people um, in the community as well. So I think community education and conversations um, have been really helpful in that respect. But there's there's definitely room for more conversation, I think. Genius, thank you so much, Tess. I might quickly go to a question from Claire um, in our audience, and she's asking, what is the view of police and lawyers on the panel, please, retaking civil action to sue perpetrators for their abuse, including online abuse? Do you know who is taking legal action in this way and what outcomes are they seeing? Lauren, maybe you might want to kick us off. Yeah, although I think my answer is probably very brief in that um, I don't have any exposure to the suing aspect other than to say that um, that's a civil remedy and the burden of proof is lower than it is for a criminal um, case. So our preference is all... My preference is that we charge people criminally if we can. Um, so that that's that's kind of the first and foremost response police want to encourage. If even if we can't charge someone, we can. There are other things we can do, like taking an intelligence report, um, and so recording the information, even if it hasn't met the threshold of a crime. Um, that also gives us a really good insight into behaviours and trends, and potentially linking someone's behaviour if they're a uh, recidivist and doing it to other people. So that's always our preference. What does that, I'm sure there are people in our audience who'd be very curious about that um, and would find that a great um, support or something um, to hold on to. What does that kind of thing involve? Would that just be going down to the police station and making a report? Yeah, look, at, the, at this point, it, um, there is a way, you, you can actually make a report of this behaviour online um, mm -hmm. as well. I'm just trying to think of the name of the... Um, the e-safety commissioner? Uh, yeah, no, there was a, there's another one as well. We actually get a, a very small amount of um, uh, crime reports, for want of a better term, through a national, um, a national hotline. I, haven't, I just haven't got it in front of me, but I can probably find it out and send it to you afterwards. When I say small, like, you know, a handful of cases, you can report abuse online and it will make its way through to Victoria or New South Wales or wherever um, it, the, the actual offending has occurred. Um, but I think the main thing is to um, go to a police station if you're, if you're wanting to report the harassment, um, explain to the police officer um, what has happened. And, and if through that conversation it is established that we haven't met the threshold of a criminal offence, Certainly a victim could request, well, could you take a report of the information itself? And then we can, um, so it's on record in case it happens again, or there are other victims out there who might come forward. I think that's really important. There's a, definitely an intelligence role for police in this, in this type of crime thing. Thank you, Lauren. Sophie, I wonder if you might speak to the question about civil action. It's probably one, in fact, better for Tess um, Marie. Okay. Right. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I will piggyback off what uh, Sophie was discussing earlier in relation to bringing civil, um, sorry, bringing criminal complaints. So in the civil jurisdiction, we do have um, similar difficulties that Sophie was discussing before. So we do have the issue of identity. So if we can't identify who is harassing our client, um, then we can't bring a claim against them. So that is definitely one issue that's present um, with online harassment. Um, the other is the issue of um, the legislative, um, the, the available um, claims that you can bring. So um, even though the standard of proof is lower in civil claims, it doesn't mean that if um, conduct, which is harassment, um, if it doesn't reach the criminal um, if it doesn't fit into a criminal claim, it doesn't mean that it will actually fit into a civil claim. There's plenty of behaviour that occurs in the public sphere, sphere that isn't unlawful under um, any, 
any civil legislation that we have currently, which is very disappointing and frustrating, but something that we do um, have to manage. Um, and the third is the issue of delay. So um, there is a backlog with um, criminal matters and Marion was discussing this earlier, the difficulty that she had with her, um, her personal issues. But if you were to file, for instance, a sexual harassment claim in the um, the federal court at the moment, you probably wouldn't get in front of a judge for about 18 months. Um, and that would be a pretty standard um, time, time stay, uh, timeline. Um, the other issues that we have with um, bringing a civil claim is the issue of cost. So of course, if you are uh, making a criminal complaint, the police take that on, on your behalf. Um, but when you're bringing the complaint yourself, so you're suing the person who's harassing you, in most circumstances, you'll have to take on the cost of that process yourself. Um, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, you're going to be in a no cost jurisdiction, which is where um, each party bears their own costs, or you're going to be in a cost jurisdiction where um, the losing party pays the costs of the winning party. Um, these claims can be very expensive to bring. Um, and that's definitely a consideration that our clients have to take into account. Um, a client might have a really good claim when it comes to proving that they've been harassed and that they've experienced um, pain and suffering as a result of that, um, that there's um, hurt and distress and humiliation. Maybe they've lost income as a result of um, the behaviour. But if the value of that pain and suffering or the value of their loss of income um, doesn't exceed the cost of the lawyers, um, then in most circumstances, they, will, they won't choose to bring a claim. So um, it, it can be a frustrating process, but most cases don't actually end up going in front of a judge. Um, we, we only see, I think the last um, matter we saw was maybe this year or last year, that they're very infrequent. Most matters settle. Um, so we see that as a reflection of maybe it, the claims being sought, but the, um, the parties being sued, seeing such risk um, to an adverse outcome against them that they are they're wanting to finalise the claim. Thank and you. Yes. Yes. Maria, I could just add very briefly to what Tessa said in response to this question, that if individuals have been convicted of criminal offences, there can be some remedies available for compensation also, um, whether that is through VCAT, the Victims of Crime, um, or other means. Uh, but that really is dependent on an outcome of um, criminal um, charges. Um, and Lauren, um, who is tuning in, says the national platform is called ACORN. Is that ringing a bell for you? <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Um, all right, terrific. I uh, might just, we're running out of time, but I might quickly just go to Caitlin um, to tell us a little bit, a bit more about what Cyber Smart, Smart Women is as a resource um, and how do people access it? Sure thing. So um, the Cyber Smart Women resource is, an, um, is a document that has been uploaded onto the Gender Equity Victoria website. I think Jacinta, my colleague, has posted the link in the chat. So. It is a step-by-step -step guide in terms of what avenues, legal avenues are available to women who've been harassed online. So the first step is looking after yourself and your safety. The second step is collecting evidence. The third step is report is making a report. And the final step is sort of, you know, if you're thinking going back to that like burden of proof and the other legal options that might be available to you if you um, are looking are looking to pursue that um, further. It's really designed so that we have a bit more transparency about what the law is able to offer in terms of action when it comes to online harassment and abuse. So Genvic has worked for, um, we've been doing work on online abuse and harassment for a number of years in, in terms of trying to manage um, or reduce it and to uh, prevent it in the first place. And so this work kind of complements that existing um, portfolio, I suppose, um, in terms of sort of ad adding a bit more transparency about what currently exists, where it can be useful, where it sort of might not be the most appropriate avenue, if you know, um, and sort of trying to fill in some of that gap. I think the questions that have been raised today are really, are really important in terms of um, us understanding what, um, what's possible. 
Um, and I'm curious about the, um, the relationship that you've developed with uh, both uh, Morris Blackburn, George and Duke, Duke and George rather, um, the police, and that kind of two-way reporting. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Of course, yes. So part of the um, of this piece of work is providing um, feedback to and like having an ongoing discussion with Lauren and her colleagues um, at Victoria Police in terms of um, being able to. I guess advocate for women in terms of what's um, in terms of what they are what they're reporting about their experiences. You know, we have heard today that you know not everybody and Lauren said herself not everybody goes to the police and has a terrific experience. And part of this is about us having a really honest and open conversation about what is available, what's possible, um, what the expectations should be and where there could be um, further change on, on sort of both sides. So what the police are seeing in terms of what reports are coming in, but also what we're seeing in terms of what's, what's, been, what's, being, um, what's going to them as well. So I think that really for us, it's about addressing online harassment as a, from a community standpoint, so as, a, as a community issue and as something that we need to address um, holistically. Terrific. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, sadly, we're all out of time, but I want to thank our panellists today for their time and expertise. Thank you, Lauren, Sophie, Tess, Caitlin and Mariam. I'd also like to thank the team at Gender Equity Victoria and my wonderful colleagues at the Victorian Women's Trust for bringing us this event today. And last but not least, congratulations to Gender Equity Victoria for their work developing the CyberSmart resource, um, which I encourage you all to go visit immediately and share amongst your networks. Thanks you to everyone for tuning in and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.